So reading in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is God's word. See, thanks Michael. One of the uh, most interesting dynamics of kind of our day, and it's really kind of been around for a long time, but something that I want to point out is this idea of exclusivity. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this tension before. Kind of some people are in, some people are out. Some people have things, some people don't. Um, and, you know, 30 years ago, you had to be in a country club, apparently, according to the movies, right? Like a lot of things happened in country clubs. And so uh, if you played golf and tennis, you had access to the clubhouse, all that stuff, and you watch any movie from the 80s, it made it seem like you achieved status if you were an adult, if you uh, had a country club membership. But this idea still persists, Right? Um, certain restaurants in major cities, you have to have kind of an in. You have to know somebody in order to get a reservation. Um, you know, some of you know about that, uh, that area called Club 33 at Disneyland. I'm not sure if anybody's been there before, but it's, a, it's, it's probably this restaurant that most of us will never go to because we don't know somebody who can get us in. And, and that's sad, but that's okay. Um, a few years ago, my wife and I happened to know somebody who um, knew somebody who was into magic. And so um, anybody like magic here? All right. Okay. Exciting. All right. There's no magic shows, by the way, happening right now. So I don't want to get you too excited or anything, but um, magic is fun. And there's this place called the Magic Castle in, uh, in LA. And maybe some of you guys have been there before, but if you know the right person, if you can get an invite, basically um, it's this big old mansion. And um, again, if you know somebody, you can kind of get in for dinner and you have to wear certain clothes and you have to kind of um, act a certain way, but they'll serve you dinner. And then you can walk around these, these rooms and kind of see these little parlor shows of uh, illusionists do their thing in, at the Magic Castle. And it's really exciting, and it's really cool, and it's pretty neat. So if you dress the right way, if you, you know, no photos allowed, if you know the right person, you too can get into the Magic Castle. And this is a question that I think the powers that be, whoever those people are, are oftentimes answering, right? Like, who gets in, who gets out? Like, who's out? Uh, who's a part of the group, who's not? And uh, who's in and who's out. And so today we're going to look at this passage in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, Jesus is going to make it very clear the kind of people that get in to the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to see this morning. Who gets in? Who, in other words, who did Jesus come for? What was his target audience? Who was the select group of people that he came for? And so as we look back at what we've covered so far in Mark chapter 1 and 2, uh, we see some some clues of the kind of people who belong in the kingdom. First of all, we see that he selects his disciples. And what we learn from that is that the kingdom is actually about Jesus himself. It's about being drawn not only to just a mission and to a lifestyle and, and to this religion, but it's being drawn to a person. He says, follow me. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so eventually Christ will call the disciples to not only follow him, but to do what he did uh, as well. Second we see in Mark is this uh, demon-possessed man being delivered from, from his sin. And so he shows up at this synagogue and we see this moment where uh, this kingdom power that Jesus represents kind of clashes with the supernatural and all that's happening in regards to, to that. Third, we see um, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. It's an amazing miracle. And, and then after that, many other people are healed that day. And so we see that, that, uh, that Jesus can actually confront brokenness and sin uh, through his power. Fourth, he heals the leper. 
And we learn his kingdom is, is one where spiritual uncleanliness can be replaced with personal righteousness. And then fifth, last week we talked about how he forgave the paralyzed man. And that was important because he didn't just heal the paralyzed man, but he forgave the paralyzed man. And this is what Jesus has come to do. So all these are snapshots of Christ's life. And it helps us prepare and think about this idea of who did he come for? Who's in the kingdom of God? Who, what, for what purpose did he come in many ways? And we see through Mark 1 and 2 that he came to interact with the broken, the lost, the sinful, those who were demon-possessed, those who were physically unhealthy, sinners who are in need of forgiveness. And so the passage that Michael just read perhaps puts it most clearly. In fact, let's go ahead and just give away the end right now. You guys just read it. Chapter 2 of Mark, verse 17. He says at the very end that those who are well have no need of, of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So that is great news. Do you realize that? That is great news for us because this flies in the face of so many stereotypes that, that the culture and the world has about Christianity. The, the stereotypes that like we have to be perfect to be accepted. The, the stereotype that we have to have our stuff together in order for God to love us. This, this idea that we have to uh, perform or, or do or be good at things in order for God to accept us into his family. And none of that's true. What we see from scripture is that Christ came for sinners. And that is good news for you and I. But there's a catch. To get into the kingdom, to have that access, it requires an immense spiritual self-awareness. Meaning that we have to know that we're sinners. And that's actually kind of hard to swallow at sometimes because there are many people who are gifted and talented and good at things. And there are a lot of times that we will um, compare our lives to others uh, who are our neighbors, who are coworkers and friends. And so as long as we self-justify and self-excuse and self-approve, we are like the Pharisees who are outside the kingdom. So let's dive into this passage. And before we get to the question, who's in the kingdom, and talk more about Levi, I want to just give a a little bit of background of what Jesus is up to here. Uh, He's just healed the paralytic. Remember the guy who was lowered down uh, into the roof by his friends? That amazing story, right? And so he has this official kind of first run in with the scribes of the law in Mark chapter 2. He heals and forgives the man, and we pick up in verse 13. So verse 13, what we see in Mark 2, 13, that he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. So this episode begins with Jesus going out, walking by the ocean. Now, why does Mark say it that way? Why does he say that he went out again? Well, if you recall, the last time that Mark uses this language is uh, Peter, he was at, uh, Jesus is at Peter's house doing amazing things, healing people, teaching. He's doing all these miracles. And by the time everybody comes through the doors and he heals all that, those crowds, he's exhausted. And so he goes to sleep probably very late that night. And the next morning we read in Mark 1.38 that Jesus woke up early before everybody else and went out to the wilderness And he spent time with the Lord in prayer and understanding God's will. And Mark tells us this is what he he does again and again. So Jesus here in Mark 2, verse 13, Jesus went out again beside the sea. This time he's walking by the ocean, right? He's kind of getting this early morning walk in. And it's this practice that Christ followed. And it's, it's meant to be instructive for us that we see this again and again that he went to Peter's house. Everyone came from far and away. He taught them the word. It was crowded. Jesus forgave and healed the paralytic. And he's again doing this. He goes out for solitude and prayer with his father. This is a great pattern of life for us. A great pattern. Get alone with God. Be recharged. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Seek God's will. Then serve others. Right? You serve others with all your heart. Then withdraw to, 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 alone, to be alone with God again. Pray, worship, listen to the Holy Spirit, and then serve others. So it's repeat every day, on repeat. And this is what Christ models to us. And so in verse 13, the crowd finds him at the beach. They come to him, and he starts to teach. 
And then we are introduced to this guy named Levi. And this is who I want to kind of really use. This is who Mark uses as the example of who gets into the kingdom of God. Our first point this morning is this. Jesus calls people just like Levi. Jesus calls people like Levi. So we see this in verses 13 and 14. Let's look at verse 14. He passed by. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So who is Levi? Let's talk about Levi as a person just for a minute here. First thing we know about Levi from verse 14 and then also from Luke 5.27, that Levi was a guy who worked at Capernaum as a tax collector. And if you grew up in church or maybe you've been around church a little bit, you've perhaps heard about what it means to be a tax collector in this time and age, but I don't want to assume that you, you do know that. So let me just explain what tax collectors did a little bit. So uh, tax collectors would have been involved probably in some type of almost uh, kind of like a toll keeper, uh, especially while all the Roman roads are being built, all the businesses are coming through, and they would have required a, a fee or a tax to kind of come by their, their area. And so taxmen in this era are not really like IRS agents. So you might have a weird relationship with the IRS. I don't know where you're at with taxes. Hopefully you pay your taxes. Um, but it, don't think taxman, uh, tax collector equals IRS agent. It's not the same thing because the taxmen in this era, they made their living by explicitly overtaxing the people. They would do so on purpose, and they charged more than was required, and this is how they got rich in the process. And so not only did they do this, but it was legal for them to do this. It was actually encouraged by the Roman government. So as a result, the Jewish community had this just full-on hatred for tax collectors because it was their own people who were employed by the Roman government who would tax them and overtax them and be oppressive in that way. And so they were oftentimes expelled from synagogues. Oftentimes uh, they were kind of whispered about and talked about. And so in, in other words, think of somebody who maybe perhaps l l makes their living off of like producing pornography or, or somebody who was a pimp putting girls out in the street. This is the kind of reputation that a tax collector would have at this time. And this is how Levi kind of walked the streets. He, was, he had money in his pockets but he had zero respect in society. And so Levi was, in, in a way, a social outcast. Um, by the way, the name that we know Levi as, most of us do, as the disciple of Jesus, who is Matthew. Uh, Matthew is his actual, another name for Levi. It's possible that Christ changed Levi's name to Matthew. It's also possible that, that Levi, as he started to follow Christ, he's like, I need a fresh start, and so I'm going to change my name to Matthew instead. It's not clear through Scripture, but Levi is called by Jesus. He says, follow me, and he rose and followed him. And so what does Levi do? He does it immediately. He follows Christ immediately. And what compels Levi to do this. Now, one of the things that I want you to remember is that when the four fishermen from Mark 1 left their businesses to follow Christ, they could do, they could leave and then occasionally come back and actually do their work. Uh, they were fishermen. And so that was an important job in the community in the time. And so for them to leave their trade and come back occasionally wasn't a big deal. This was not the case for Levi. Once Levi left his job to follow Christ, he could never come back and be a tax collector again. And so when Levi left it, he left it for good. He realized that, that some jobs are not compatible with the Christian faith. And, and maybe you even perhaps this morning work in a job like this where it's a little bit on the fence as far as like, can I really maintain my Christian witness or, or actually engage in a faithful way in my relationship with the Lord and still work at this place? And, and that's a question that, that through the, the work of the Holy Spirit, you have to decide. But for Levi, he realized that he could not continue his work as a tax collector and still follow Christ. And so he left and he never looked back. And so what was the result? Let's chase this rabbit for a minute. This may have been hard in the moment for Levi to leave his job. But this was the best choice of his whole life. I mean, let me put it this way. Would you rather be a corrupt tax official who maybe made some money in his heyday, 
but then no one remembers for the rest of his life and throughout history? Or would you rather do as Levi did and become Matthew and write the gospel of Matthew and serve as one of Christ's uh, disciples? Levi became an exciting part of God's kingdom. And this is exactly what Jesus does. He gives hope to the hopeless. He calls out the outcast. He gives meaning to the meaningless. He includes the unincludable. And so I just want to encourage us to remember and, and emulate this example that Matthew puts forward. And, and don't be afraid to follow Christ because it is worth the cost. And if you are a believer this morning, if you're already a Christian, you may recall there are certain things that you left behind in order to follow Jesus. It may be a career, it could be a, you know, a relationship, a desire, a, a sin, an attitude. Whatever you say uh, that, that thing was, it was likely worth it to leave those things behind in order to follow Christ. And if Levi were here today, he would say the same thing. It is worth it. It is worth it to follow Jesus. He's so much better than anything that the world has to offer. And so Levi serves as an example of those that Christ follows, that Christ calls to follow him. And maybe this morning you are just like Levi. You are being called to action through this very sermon, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's obvious what you need to do. You need to walk away from your old life and your old friends and follow Christ today. And if this is you, I encourage you, follow Levi's lead and don't wait. And I pray that you would all just lay it down for the cause of Christ. But here's the amazing thing. What we see here in Mark 2 is that when someone follows Jesus, it doesn't just impact them. It impacts a whole group around them. It wasn't just about Levi and his willingness to follow Christ. We also see that there's a collateral effect on his whole community because of Levi's obedience. And so point number two that I want to point out here is this. Levi's obedience opens the door for other people. Levi's obedience opens the door for others. We see this in verse 15. It says this, and he reclined at table in his house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So the day of salvation in your life and in my life, it ought to be a, a moment of celebration. I, I hope that you have properly celebrated the day of your salvation. Um, and this is certainly the case for Levi. And so he becomes a follower of Jesus. And so he throws this party, basically. He invites everybody over to his house. And he invites Jesus and he invites his friends. And guess what? His friends happen to be a bunch of tax collectors and sinful people. And, and so they gather around this table as was their custom. And they recline and they feast together and talk and uh, laugh and enjoy the day. It was a celebration. It was a celebration, but in a way, it's also kind of a farewell party because Levi is about to follow Jesus into this unknown. He has this new life calling and adventure in front of him. But Levi's obedience to follow Jesus opens the door for all these people who are far from Christ to come and, and be in his presence. And this is really what's amazing about when salvation happens. It does not just impact that person being saved. It impacts a whole group, a whole family. Oftentimes you read through the Gospels and also through Acts, especially in Acts in the early church, that one person was saved and the whole family was saved and baptized as a result. This is the power of salvation at work. And this can be true for, for you in your life. What an amazing opportunity that you would celebrate your salvation in a way where people would, would come in and look at what God is doing. Now, not everybody sees it this way. We see that the religious leaders, these scribes, these Pharisees, can't believe that this like, low-life group of society has gathered up together. And they're even more disgusted that Jesus, this rabbi who's supposed to be, you know, impressive and he has this crowd is front and center and a part of kind of this, this terrible group of people. He's eating with these people. He's talking to these people. And, and they're kind of indignant about it. They're frustrated by it. They don't understand why would Jesus associate with these people? Well, it, it kind of negates everything he's doing, right? And so there's this attitude about this group. And what comes to mind for me is if, if Obi-Wan Kenobi was describing this place, uh, Moss Eisley Spaceport, 
You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy, right? Like, that's kind of the attitude of this house. It's like, this is just a bunch of scummy people, right? A bunch of terrible folks that have gathered together. These outcasts, these sinners, these lawbreakers, all in one place. And you can kind of just sense the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. But for all their knowledge and study, they have forgotten that this is the way that God has always engaged with sinful people. If you look at the Old Testament, it foreshadows example of after example of God using sinful, terrible people to do his will. Let me just remind you of, of what it says. God, God does this all the time. Noah had a problem with alcohol. Abraham was fearful and compromised his character. Isaac was passive. Jacob was a deceiver. David was a murderer and a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. And over and over again, we see that God shows that he is quick to forgive and that he is quick to put people to work for his purpose. That's who God is. That's who God, what God does. And the book of Exodus describes a God who is incredibly patient with the people of Israel. Let me read this to you from Exodus 34. It's on the screen behind me as well. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God of merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will but by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the, fa- of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is God's character, and it's always been the same. And so if you've ever gotten this sense that there is a Old Testament God versus kind of hippie, like nice Christ in the New Testament, like that's, that's a false dichotomy. It's the same God. He's always been loving. He's always been merciful. He's always been slow to anger. And this is what Jesus does, and he shows us here in Mark 2 as well. And so we've already learned a little bit about the kingdom of God at this point in Mark, but now it becomes crystal clear that the kingdom is for sinners. The door is wide open to those who are broken. And God uses the obedience of Levi, leaving it all behind in order to remind us this morning that God sent his son to save and forgive the worst of the worst, the scum of the earth, those who have no right or place to be associated with him. He brings them in and says, you are, you are my friends. You are who I want to associate with. You are who are, are far from God. And because of my presence here, you are now made whole. But as we narrow in on this last point this morning, I want you to realize that we perhaps have more in common with this this group than we realize. Because we too are lost and broken. We too are sick and sinful. And so this last point shines the light back on us this morning. Because remember, number three is that Jesus calls people just like us. Jesus calls people just like us. And and so there you have it. Jesus says it clearly in verses 16 and 17. The scribes of the Pharisee, when they saw he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with these people? Why, Why does he do this? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. He says it clearly. I came not for the healthy, but for the Uh, not for the righteous, but for the sick and for the sinners. And and to be honest, this kind of worldview is not compatible with the worldview of the religious elite. This is not how they see the world. And so let's, let's talk about just for a minute, who are these scribes of the Pharisees mentioned in verse 16? The scribes of the Pharisees in verse 16. Something that might help is to understand the word, the, the name Pharisee, it actually means separate ones. It means separate ones. And to, and, and to separate was their mission. They, they believed as pious Jews that their goal was to kind of, in a way, build up a fence around the Torah to avoid any possible violation of God's will. And so they wanted to make it as clear as possible that this is what holiness looks like. And, and so in, in a way, I kind of 
uh, empathize with these, these scribes and the Pharisees because they took this, this heartbeat, this thing that God thought was important. Absolutely, the Ten Commandments were very important to God and His people. And yet they kind of built up all these rules around it in order for it to be even more difficult. And so this group of Pharisees, when they saw Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors, they're appalled because they were about separation. And so to, to them, Jesus was not playing ball. He was not doing what was expected. And so they turn to the disciples and they say, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Which in a way is just typical, right, of the Pharisees, because you see, they are capable of like these backroom deals and whispers and half-truths. And so it should not surprise you at all that they have a problem with Christ and they don't deal with it directly and they gossip sideways instead. Friends, don't be a Pharisee. If you have a problem, deal with the person directly. That's not from the passage. That's just free for you guys. But listen, Jesus hears their questions. Jesus understands their their concerns. And he responds with this well-known and widely received proverb from the time that those who are well have no need of a physician, but it's those who are sick. And this is a profound statement from Christ. This is profound because a doctor treats those who are unhealthy. I'm not sure if you guys go to your kind of, I forgot what they call them, like your, your, your well, uh, like kind of, what they're called? Yeah, you're well checked. I don't know. You go sometimes, you're just supposed to make sure that you are not sick, right? Like, uh, that's, it kind of seems pointless in a way. It's like, here I am, taking my blood pressure and, and like, you know, making sure that I'm, I am uh, not doing uh, terrible things in my life and not smoking, not drinking, all, all these things that the doctors care about. But Jesus says, look, what's really important is if you're sick, you go to a doctor and you get that checked out. You make sure that you're in that consistent rhythm of, 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 of that. And so he hears the question, and he says, look, I am like that doctor who comes uh, not when you're healthy, but when you're sick. And because the Pharisees are separatists, they strove to be separate from sin. They're elite. They're super religious. But the Pharisees do nothing that's helpful because they don't create new ways to be holy. They simply invent new ways to sin. That's what they kind of do here. They make an extra rule or law and say, nope, you can't do that either. It's even harder to, uh, to, to actually do the law as it says. But Jesus sees separation entirely different. And Jesus engages the sinner on their level. He engages the sick on their level. If you recall um, during COVID, during the pandemic, many of us uh, called our, our doctors, called our primary healthcare people, And I don't know about you, but oftentimes I got told to call a number and I would talk to my doctor or a nurse over the phone. Or if I was really sick, I might be on a Zoom call with them, right? There was this level of that's how I would receive care. That's how we would receive care during the pandemic. Versus what we really need, if you're truly sick, is for a, a doctor to come to your home. A doctor to come to the foot of your bed and see you and treat you in your actual state of sickness. And this is the difference between the Pharisees and Jesus in the setting. The Pharisees just simply say, hey, I see you from over there. You're not doing it right. You're being sinful. You're, you're yet doing another thing that would drive, uh, drive something between you and following God's perfect law. And Jesus says, I'm like the doctor who has come to the sick, to your house, to treat you. And this is Christ for us. He has not come to distance himself from patients who need his care, but to heal them directly. And while he does that, he never sins in the process. He never gets sick himself. He is, he's perfect through the whole process. Uh, Rosario Butterfield, a, a writer, says, Jesus dined with sinners, but he didn't sin with sinners. Jesus lived in the world, but he didn't live like the world. And this is the Jesus paradox. He's like a doctor going to the sick. And he also says he did not come for righteous people, but sinners. And so why does he say this? Why does he add the aspect about righteousness? Well, Jesus makes it clear that he could not help the Pharisees as long as they thought that they were sinless. They didn't know that they were sick. They didn't know that they were sinful. They couldn't see their sin. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, as long as we are people who do not think that we do not sin, Jesus cannot help us either. 
And so we have to see ourselves in that way. The sick person, the sinful person, this is how the Bible describes you and I. Do you see that? Is that clear to you? That we are all sinners who have fallen short from the glory of God. Now, the, the problem with this label of sin today is that most will object to their sickness or sinfulness. And perhaps this has even been you in your life. I'm not broken. I'm awesome. I'm not a sinner. There are, are way more people who are more sinful than me. Right? Like, I, I don't need to be made well. Like, look who's talking. You need to be made well, right? And there's this combativeness. There's this defensiveness that we feel at times. And if this is our posture, we have no way forward. We have no way forward. And any of us who is now in Christ, if you are a Christian, recall that if you believe the gospel, that belief began with some type of confession that I am a sinner. I need grace. I am broken. And this is who we still are. This is who we are at the King's Church, that we are sinners seated around that same table with Christ. We need him. We need his grace. We need his forgiveness. And we need his righteousness. And we need that great doctor to come into our room and to heal us. And let me just, let me just speak to my, my own heart here too. Just have, have you listen. This is not just for a, that one-time repentance when we became Christians all those years ago. We still need the gospel. We still need cleansing. We still need uh, our sin to be removed from us. It's not just the one-time thing uh, 10, 20, 50 years ago. It doesn't matter. Every day, we continue to fall and fail and become ill with sin. Uh, I want you to think about just this last week. Think about the last few days. And, and it, it can become convicting pretty fast here, but just think about the ways that you have sinned and, and did it wrong. Think about the areas where you've fallen short, maybe with your kids or with your spouse or with a friend. Maybe you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Maybe you, you, you didn't kind of live up in a certain area. Maybe you didn't accomplish what you said you would do and you made a liar out of yourself. Or, or maybe you've been lustful or maybe you've been proud or maybe you've been aggressive and angry. Whatever it could be, you realize that, man, I'm still not quite 100% sanctified. There's still work to be done in my own heart. And Jesus came for you in the same way he came for Levi. Some of you this morning don't need me to remind you that you're sinful. Uh, I think that there's some of us who just have the, the posture and propensity just to kind of be like, yep, I'm a screw up. I know that. Uh, you know that better than anyone. But this, this same passage, this truth is for you this morning too, because maybe for you, your deal is that you don't, you don't buy Jesus' love for you. You don't see that. I don't believe God loves me because I'm a screw up, because I've, I'm sinful, because I'm sick. And if that's you this morning, I hope that on the other hand, that you see God's heart for sinners and for the sick. And you see that scripture says that you are more than the sum total of your worst mistakes, that your current circumstances don't define who you are in the eyes of Christ. You're not what people say you are, that God sees you differently, and he sees that you are a person who is created for a purpose, and you may be broken, and you may be trapped, and you may be uh, lost in your sin, but Jesus wants to befriend you too. And he doesn't want you just to hear a bunch of laws and rules and, and ways for you to impress him, for you to, to work hard uh, so that you look good in front of him. No, he wants you to experience him as a friend, a friend who sits closer than a brother and the one who will never leave you or forsake you. And that is his heart for you. He's pursuing you. He wants to forgive you. There might be a, a last group here that I just want to address as well. And I think sometimes we float in between these groups a little bit, right? Um, listen, church, even as we think about people who might be present with us, who feel like an outcast, who feel shunned, we have to wonder and ask ourselves, well, what's, what's our heart for people like that? Is our heart like, like Christ's heart for those people? Do we share the heart of Jesus for people? You know, having been loved like Jesus has loved us, when we were in our brokenness, when we were befriended by him, when we were cared for him, when we were sick and pursued and forgiven, and transformed by the, by the gospel. 
how can we now treat other people any differently? How can we still be like the Pharisees and say, like, how, why would we want to interact with people like that? And so my encouragement to, to that group is that we would just lay ourselves bare before the Lord to see ourselves, maybe not as, as Levi in the story, but as the scribes, as the Pharisees. And I would encourage you, if, if that's where you are this morning, if you are cynical towards those who are broken, if you are judgmental of those in the church who don't have it together, we must ask God to forgive us of our self-righteousness and to help us love our neighbors the way that God loves them, to befriend them and pursue them the way Christ did for us. This is the good news of Mark 2, that God loves us, he came for us, and he wants to include us in the story. And so will we humble ourselves and will we follow him as Levi did? I hope you will. Let's pray together. God, we, are, we're thankful for, uh, for what you've done, Lord, through the calling of the disciples. Lord, I think about each of these guys who uh, were living their own lives and doing their own things, um, really without any thought or concern for what you're doing, Lord. And God, I, I, I think that many of us are, are like those disciples, and many of us are perhaps like Levi this morning, where we're mixed up in doing our own things that don't glorify you, that don't even give mention to who you are and what you're doing. And so God, would you bring us together in a way to remind us of, of your call for followership, that at times it means to leave all those things behind and to radically change our lives to, to repent and to turn away from our sin and to follow you instead. God, would you uh, create that conviction in our hearts this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit, not through my words, not through uh, music or anything that we might be um, a part of this morning, but Lord, through your word and through the Holy Spirit, would you convict hearts? Would you call people to repentance and call them to follow you? God, for, for maybe those of us who have been Christians, Lord, would you remind us that our lives ought to look like your son, Jesus? That we're supposed to um, follow, follow you in a way, God, that is inclusive, that reminds people that we are for them, uh, that we are we want to encourage them, that we want to be behind them, Lord, and that we would invite them in in ways that are hospitable and bring people to your feet. God, help us in these things. We love you and praise your name. Amen. Amen.